I've been immersed in elephant world ever since I was a baby. And I love being amongst elephants. It makes me feel whole. There's something about being in the presence of that intelligence, which is very humbling, and that when you look at an elephant in the eye, you know that they recognize your intelligence in turn, and they are conscious beings. I have no doubt about that. Yes, an elephant has a big soul. In fact, maybe bigger than the human soul. It's pure, it's unpolluted, it knows no evil. Maybe they have more because we, as people, have forgotten to look after each other. The question should really be, do we have souls like elephants? They're so complex, they're so emotional, and the family structure is so interesting socially, and the whole social system with its tiers of relationships. They have such a sense of fun. Once you start getting to know them, you really recognize them as individuals. Before coming here, I've only actually seen elephants in zoos, so it's been quite an experience seeing them in the wild and seeing them interacting as families, because in zoos, as you might know, they're often by themselves or not with families, so just watching them with their children, with their sisters and aunts and mothers. It's been quite an experience. When babies go into a hole or they run into trouble, <coughs> the response the group has towards, you know, an animal that is in trouble is amazing. <coughs> you know, everyone stops its activity, everyone stops the food is eating, everyone stops everything. Everyone rush there quickly. Like, what is the problem? People don't really view an elephant as something that thinks is as intelligently as they are. But one thing they don't know is that maybe elephants are more intelligent than us. Well, I've been working with elephants now 50 years. I can categorically say they are just like us, but better than us. They have an amazing intuition and perception. Nature takes two years to create an elephant in the womb and only nine months to make a man. And I think that puts it in perspective. It just would be such a loss if we lose elephants.
There he is. We got him. Okay. Stop that. Turn the engine. We might have to get out of here. Keep going. I don't think we can play around with Mountain Bull because he's been wounded and he might be unhappy. Hold it there, hold it. Now he's turned. Great. Okay, there, that's it. Oh my god. Poor old boy. Well, anyway, he looks pretty healthy, which is fantastic. Mountain bull is an animal that we selected and we have been following every day. If mountain bull says this is the way, that's where they're gonna follow. He and like five, six elephants behind him. It's an animal that's teaching us that there are some parts that have been used by elephant for many years, which we don't know. Yeah, it's in the mountain bull here. All the people around here, they put the fences, they put houses. He goes through the fence, he goes through the villages, Electric fence, you can break it in a way that you could imagine an animal can do that. Mountain bulls have been crossing the highway for many years and it's so dangerous. That's how the idea of corridor came alive because of this intelligent animal telling us that we need to create a path for animals. So the underpass was being built, there was a lot of money being spent. We have been praying when the corridor was not there that it will not be hit by a vehicle any time. As we speak today, we have more than 400 elephants have gone under that path going up to Mount Kenya and coming back. Mountain bull is one of our key research elephants. We've been studying him for years. I first came across him, must have been 2008, where he was really being a pest. And he'd been doing his usual stuff of, of uh, figuring out how to unlock gates and then charging through the wheat fields, snacking along the way, and then finding his pass through these small little sustainable farms where he'd go in and, you know, have an, a snack of 30 cabbages. And actually what really struck me was how accommodating they were of him. And I remember one farmer saying to me, if they eat our cabbages whilst they're coming through, we understand because they're hungry. They hit her over here, and when they get satisfied, they went straight to the fire. Straight through the fire? Straight to the fire. Yeah. Oh. They have no one to cook for them. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't make it any easier for the farmer because they'd had half of their crop taken out by him. They come to eat some maize, destroying the fields here. Yeah. Hit the chains on the drums like this. Then this sound chases the elephants away. I actually had an amazing encounter with Mountain Bull. We were actually following his trail to see exactly where it was that he'd gone. And eventually, of course, it ended up with Mountain Bull. And he was down in the lowlands with a herd of females. He was in must. So he was just oozing with testosterone. He was absolutely fantastic and in his prime, quite feisty and aggressive. And I remember just driving up quite close to him and I took this incredible photograph of him sort of looming there in the foreground with a, this herd of females in the background and Mount Kenya in the far distance. And I just remember thinking then, what an absolutely magnificent animal. a living, sensate, intelligent creature which really 
took your breath away. We've got elephants that have broken my heart completely. The likes of Kwanzaa, whose mother was killed by poachers, she saw it happen and she was found protecting the dead body of the mother. This baby elephant is approximately two months old. She was separated from her family. We suspect that her family encroached on human farm. She was left with four spear wounds. She is in lots of pain. They wanted to kill her intentionally as a revenge. So you can imagine a such a tiny young baby elephant being speared brutally, just like that, with the human beings. Some of the bones here bear the brunt of potting with bullets. This was one of the biggest bulls, his name is Mungu, which is a Swahili word meaning God, because he was so massive with gigantic ivory. My goodness, taller than taller than myself. Like that 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 high. I mean his tusks were so big and thick like that. These are obviously huge tusks. They weigh in a region of something like 35 to 45 kilograms. And um, they represent some of the, once upon a time, vast herds of savannah elephants. Years ago, we were seeing large tusks seized like this at the ports and by the agents. And now what you're seeing are smaller ones like this. I mean, that's a full tusk. The average age of the elephants came up six to seven years old. My name is Joseph Kotoki Mikoki. I am a big like ant poaching officer. In 10 years to come, more there will be no elephant in this world. Because the poachers are getting 8,000 to 12,000 shillings a kilo. There's a difference between human wildlife conflict and poaching. Poacher comes direct purposely for elephant looking for money. Elephant ivory goes to these Arab countries or the Chinese. killing young and young as well as females. Because most of the bulls are already killed, you know. We used to see lots of uh, big tuskers walking up and down, but not anymore. The young elephants of 15 years old, 20 years old, are being killed. There are fewer elephants, and the demand for ivory is even higher. It's all linked with the drugs trade, the arms trade, uh, you know, it's a lust for money and uh, um, ivory is viewed as white gold. And although it's an ancient culture carving ivory, which is a lovely substance, let's face it, 
but uh, when you consider at what price that ornament is made, which has definitely killed the mother elephant and all her dependent young as well, and left those grieving and in sorrow and disrupting the entire elephant community, bearing in mind that elephants are human animals emotionally. If you kill a matriarch, they get lost. You can compare them to elders, you can compare them to grandma in a family, compare them to, to even a president of, of a country if you have a good leader. They lead, they show where can you find grass. You know, when it's a drought, where do you then go for water? It's irresponsible and it's wicked to kill an elephant for a tooth. Most believe that elephants are like elk or uh, deers that lose their horns and grow back again, which is uh, very wrong. He cannot lose a tusk until he dies. Even that tiny little stump of a tusk, it's worth money. A tooth is what the elephant is dying for. If you talk of poaching in Africa, it's a nightmare. We're losing a lot of elephants. In Mozambique, they are losing like maybe 50 elephants a day. Every single day, certain numbers of elephants are poached. But we've seen statistics that say 30 elephants a day. That is, that is bad. The rate at which they're being killed is terrifying. Obviously, some places in Africa are much worse than others. I mean, what's going on in the Congo Basin is just absolutely beyond belief. In 1976, the population of elephants in Toulouse was 110,000. It is unfortunate that the poaching wave unfolded and the population of elephants sadly has now crashed to 13,000. And where, where are these? Is this uh, Tanzania? Yes. All from Tanzania. Wow. Which, which area is it? Hmm? Sagu. Where's that? Oh, Salu. Ah, Salu. Most of the elephants that get post in most cases are living in photographic safari areas. So the problem we have with those elephants is that when they venture into hunting areas, they come across human beings, they can actually walk up to them. But the problem is that they become sitting ducks for poachers because they don't run away from human beings. They don't have a problem with human contact, so they are easy to shoot. My name is David Dabalin. My position is a field operation officer for Save the Elephant. My main work is actually to go out on a daily basis, look individually and follow their stories, their birth, their death. Basically from 2008, um, trouble started there. And 2010, 2011, 2012, things were so bad. You know, we were getting Elephant being killed right, left, and center in the park, outside the park. In, in some areas, you can actually find a heap of three elephants on top of each other. I've seen the whole thing right from the start, when the first national park was formed in 1948 in Kenya, right until today. And I can categorically say that I don't think it's ever been more sinister. They're dying in droves every single day. So what we have here is mainly African elephant ivory that's been seized by our agents in operations and by inspectors here in the United States. Those small carvings, you're talking $10,000. It's very hard to come up with an estimate. Just looking at it, you're talking probably tens of millions of dollars is what the value is on this. We 
it is complicated, countries are involved, and, and we believe China, Vietnam, and some of these countries really come forward in a very robust way to tell their citizenry to please stop. This is something that we have to stop. We have to stop it because the vast roaming herds that we know and that are so important for the ecosystems and from which we can learn so much will disappear. The way we tend to describe this uh, situation is a holocaust of elephants. How many animals have you seen in snares? Hundreds. Hundreds. Okay, you're walking along, let's see. And the more the animal struggles, the tighter it gets. If it's caught on the trunk, it might not necessarily be cut by the wire, but the lack of circulation will make the trunk rot and fall off. Hmm. I look at the elephants with children, and for no reason that is justifiable in any means, someone just takes you down, boom. And I feel like these poachers don't really know what they're doing. Kuna trip sio chini ya kumi, ambazo kila trip moja, nyingi tuliku tunafaniki kwa piga wa saba, nyingi ni mpaka ishirini, nyingi kwa trip moja. Kwaida ni risasi moja tu isipokuwa sasa wakati ule mm. ilikuwa ni kulazimisha tukimkuta tembo lazima tunahakisha tunamlaza mm. sasa kwa kupitia silaha zile tulikuwa tunapiga hata 5 6 mfululizo mm. okay. tunahakisha lazima afi I'm Cedric Wilder. We're on a private forestry concession here, and we've had it for seven years. There's poaching everywhere. And yeah, it happens, but I mean, if a person's hungry, what would you do if your kids had no food? It's one thing killing for your family to eat and to survive, but it's another point where you start going commercial. Poverty plays a big part in poaching and in truth. The people who are actually poaching don't make the big money. Seriously, this is not what you want to do. This is not the way out. I was in the western part of Serengeti, and the government brought me four dead bodies of poachers. They were young, young people, maybe 16. I was saddened because, you know what, they were working or some devil somewhere. Whoever that was a culprit is still enjoying his coffee or wine somewhere. Exploiting the poor. They were dead. And they had weapons. 
usually when you are confronted with somebody with firearms, you have to surrender. So somehow they felt they needed to also shoot. The ivory trade is perpetuating conflicts in failing states, places where terrorists, warlords, rebel groups only want guns, cash, and power over the civilian population. They call us the sound of death. Yeah, but it's a sound of music to us. There's a music, the player, we're dancing. For them, it was about money, it was about income. They were recruited. I know people who were recruited by foreign nationals in the country. They're out for profit, and the ivory trade and war helps them grasp that. See, this is the emblem of the Lord's Resistance Army. In the middle of the harp is a Ten Commandment of God. We are fighting to defend the Ten Commandment of God because people are not following the Ten Commandment of God. I think lawlessness is to do with wars in countries that are frail and volatile. So in much of Central Africa, the presence of unstable regimes, roving bands of notorious armed groups who adopt the bandit way of life. They make them trust who they are. They get into this dark business. These are wars today that are no longer about ideology or liberation or fighting tyranny. A lot of these wars are about organized banditry on a large scale. And the ivory trade plays a major part. You know, we've had the pirates in, in Somalia. They made billions by hijacking those ships and, and holding them at ransom. We have a civil war going on in Sudan. We've spoken about Blood Diamond. We have the SPLA. We have the LRA. We have M23. We have Al-Shabaab. I mean, these are just a few of the groups that are operating around East Africa. There definitely is a connection between ivory and terrorist groups. The Mai Mai in Congo, um, in Terahamwe, at the Janjaweed, they're all people who have been using ivory to fund their activities. The toll on the wildlife was already there. You know, we, we certainly saw a spike in everybody going out to the bush and shooting game so they could feed the militia. You have refugees, you have meddling neighboring countries. These are real concerns for a lot of the African people. You have people who are trying to profit from war. Illegal arms traffickers bringing in weapons. Smugglers who are taking out ivory, rhino, diamonds, gold, whatever the natural resources are. We also are going after the big fish. We've actually brought Chinese nationals that we hire to pose as buyers and they help me catch bad guys. So because of some of these intelligence um, operations that we are running across the country, we are making it very difficult for the ivory material to run. You'll be surprised to find that most of the poaching that happens in this country actually is done by, mostly by people who are supposed to be doing the protection of the animal. The parks actually don't have resources to carry out their duties and the corruption is the main issue. Because some of the poachers are even controlled by the park officials themselves. Even the major streets were also involved in the poaching. So if you see the corruption is that level, how can you be arrested? The 
problem with speaking the truth in Zimbabwe is that we can pay dearly for it, especially speaking against things that the government doesn't want people to hear. You know, my dad, he's 72 and he's had a, a tough life. He's lost his whole life's income and work. You, you know, you, there's a lot of time where people will, will not speak out um, because of, of what, what could happen to them. Basically, we've lost our camp. We had a fire. Oh, I've got to be heartbroken. Oh, we'd only been open 10 months. And then to find that we've got to start basically all again, but in another month, we're finished. So now we just start fresh again. It's hopefully we've sorted out. When you are born in a country, it is your country. And no matter what happens, I will not leave. They can do what they like. I'm third generation Zimbabwean. My great grandfather came here in 1870 and he hunted with Salu. We love this country, it has so much to offer. The elephants, the so called presidential herd, and the great massive herds of, of Wangi. It, it's hard to believe that anybody can say that they are in charge of the elephants. We are all custodians of the elephants. Yes, sir. I try and do what I can. I just want to know that I can one day look my kids in the eye and say that I did everything I could to save them my life in our area. But if I rock the boat too much, what happens to the presidential elephants then? And what happens to, to our concession and the animals that are on there? You've got to think about that. And that's a big concern. What do you say, Peter? Why don't you want to speak about things here? Hey? Seriously, what do you say? When we're gone, there's no one to protect him. Peter, anyone who speaks out against anything what's going to happen to them in, 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 in the future also. You know, the Chinese have come in. Uh, we've opened ourselves up to China. They brought in a lot of infrastructure development. The superpower of Africa, not just Tanzania, are the Chinese. They own Africa. In Zimbabwe, we often find that most Chinese guys who set up businesses in the country are actually fronting for poaching. My name is Ming. I am from China. I work for KTB China Representative. We are currently featuring a variety of Kenyan destinations, and there has been serious poaching problems here in Kenya. We have heard the saying that a lot of avarice are going to China, but uh, I am not sure of the fact because we haven't seen very much official reports about the statistics. You know, the Chinese are the biggest investors here uh, as far as giving aid in the form of development. But what they've put into this country, they take 10 times more out of this country. They are after every kind of resource they can get their hands on, whether it's gold, diamonds, rhino, ivory. It's all the same to them. They see African national parks as a means for them to grab and take and pillage whatever they can just for profit. Mining is becoming huge and um, it's not only threatening our wildlife areas, 
It's also threatening to pollute the water sources. The Chinese have just come out here recently and found that we've got a lot more coal and other deposits, um, mainly the Guai Conservancy area, which has been an amazing haven for wildlife over the years. They are hoping to put in five towers, five power houses, which we are all together fighting. We're trying to um, put a stop to that. Unfortunately, with mining, there's so much money involved. So far, what they've done is they've been raping this country. They take more than just ivory back to China. They've been extracting all the minerals, taking it back, because without the minerals of Africa, they're not sustainable. They're taking everything and anything. It's a problem because it's going to destroy a lot of the beautiful areas that you drive through to get to Wanga, the teak forests. And with that, when you start to develop little communities, there will be an increased threat of deforestation and increased threat of poaching. It was a problem that went on for something like five years before it was discovered. So the result is that the death toll from cyanide was very high. Cyanide is used in the processing of gold. Throw it once into the water pan, and if they take a drink, you can have all the elephants. If there's 200, you have. 400 tasks at one go. It wasn't just one incident. They have uncovered probably three or four separate instances. The major one that created and caused a lot of, of attention was probably 90 to 100 elephants in one place. Cyanide is a problem in that the animal dies in such pain, and these animals die in large numbers. It's not just elephants, but any other animal that comes to share the same water hole. It's easier to use cyanide to kill than to take an AK-47 and go after one elephant. The elephant psyche, this is like this giant net that stretched entirely over Africa. Little by little with hunting and poaching, that net was broken up, holes into it. With the emergence of epidemic PTSD, their physical extinction is happening, but what we're really seeing is the psychological extinction has preceded their physical extinction.
what is inside ourselves that allows us to be either indifferent or brutal to another species or another animal. You're seeing people coming to Africa and they're seeing elephants who are severely traumatized. Tourists come and they see that. And if we had the equivalent here, it would be like going to an insane asylum or going to a concentration camp or going to some other kind of facility where you're looking at refugees as a fun tourist trip. The tourists from Feist, when they come here, see the elephants, they ask how much that task weighs. That will be a very hard question for you to answer. Parallels with human beings in war, you can't help making that link. You see these desperate situations of a long-lived animal that has extremely strong attachments, emotional attachments to members of its family. You see that ripped apart, so the emotional cost is huge. When you talk about the behavior of elephants, I'm totally sure the poaching is distorting the families. Depending upon the leader of a given group, definitely the character of the remaining elephants will change. They're a bit aggressive with the stress that they've been through and uh, psychologically disturbed. They view humans as the enemy. They grieve for their family. They have nightmares at night and uh, thrash around, obviously reliving some terrible experience. Elephants are up against enormous obstacles. Beyond the poaching itself, there is this problem for space, for land, because they need vast areas in which to survive. And there is this huge growing human population. Africa's already passed one billion. How we maintain the wild places that elephants need is going to be very tricky. But I think it's a symptom of what we're facing in the planet as a whole, is that we have this crazy idea of all we needing to grow the economy, this runaway capitalism, and the fact that we live on a finite planet, and it's, the two simply don't go together. All these little elephants in the nursery are all less than two years. They are highly intelligent animals, much, much smarter than a human child of the same age. We have a group that is being fed after every six hours, and then the little four are fed on demand. So they are all anxious, they all want to go home and have their milk. Everyone wants to be number one to the stock it. That is all they are fighting for the first position. They all want to be in front. <laughs> We've raised over 150 elephants through this nursery now, and most of them are victims of poaching. And this is just the ones that are found. For every one found, there's probably a hundred others that are dying out in the bush that are not rescued and not found in time. It depends very much on the situation of an elephant after it has gone through a traumatic event. I think there's a lot of anger there and a lot of post-traumatic stress. Elephants here in Samburu, who are suffering at the hands of poachings, they certainly have those same uh, deeply traumatic experiences. But because they're still within their society, and they still have this very strong social glue, and they have the influence of older elephants who may not be related to them around them, I think that helps to keep a cap on some of the more extreme behaviors. There was a systemic pattern of strange elephant behavior. Mothers abandoning their children, um, infanticide, asociality, all of these kinds of characteristics and symptoms that were common 
among elephants in zoos, in captive situations, but extraordinary and unprecedented in wild elephants. Male elephants were killing other male elephants at another park in South Africa. 90% of male mortality was attributed to male-on-male -male killing. Never had happened in Ambicellian, quote-unquote, natural conditions. There's been a lot of interesting studies of these orphaned elephants. What was happening was they were coming into must very early, because it's really psychological. The big bulls suppress must in the younger bulls. And they feel that there are more dominant elephants around, but they have at least 10 times as much testosterone when they're in must, so they're just surging. It's a dominance thing, hormones and aggression. We used to call it the Kalashnikov revolution in elephant population dynamics. That was back then. Well, it's only got worse. And with every new conflict, you tend to get a flood of illegal weapons coming out into the hands of ordinary people. Ironically, so that I could find out more about the ivory and rhino wars, I attended the largest exhibition of weapons in South Africa. Here you had African and foreign governments on hand to show the latest technology in the anti-poaching wars. You always need the cover of a legal trade in order to peddle your illicit activities. It's a place where the legal and the illegal meet, and it's very difficult to know who is really part of the shadow world. They have been coming down here for quite a while. Everything does very well in Africa, you know, except for the Africans. You know, they dump a lot of things on us here. What is going to prevent these weapons from getting into the hands of the large syndicates who already have corrupted officials and who already have high-level influence? So you can open it this way, use a shot by shot, so full shot, close it, double action. See, this is the same. And you can fire the distance of 400 meters. When you have, uh, for example, to, to stop a truck or uh, to, let's say, enter into a house and break the door or to, to stop, let's say, a car because the power, the stopping right, okay. power is much higher than a shotgun or than a rifle. Conservation is now going to be fought by militaries, and they see anti-poaching as the way to do it. It's a bit frightening to see conservation morph before our eyes into something that wildlife managers and rangers and people entrusted with the care of animals for so long that their role is being usurped by military special forces and by weapons companies that want to bring in the latest technology.
The human lust for money and the greed of humans in this 21st century is beyond comprehension, really. It's just about money. That's all they want. And uh, they never seem to have enough. This is the sad part about it. And of course, the problem is at the other end, in the East, in China and Malaysia and places like that. And only the international community can bring pressure to bear on those governments to desist from annihilating Africa's elephants and rhinos. I have a dear friend that was actually killed by a poacher. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. They came across a bag which was lying under a bush. And Andre reversed the vehicle to get a closer look at what it was because nobody else should have been in the area. And in the bag, there were four very small elephant tusks. And all of a sudden, there was AK-47s open fire on them. The head of the police had given them the guns of that area and told them to go and shoot elephants for them. And the police had told the poachers that if they were caught with those guns, then the police would kill them. And that's why they opened fire without any warning, without any notice at all. We also know that there are people in our ranks and file who have been collaborating with poachers. The guys who are asked to go and be poachers, that we fight, we kill. Every time I send my groups, they kill these boys and, and girls who are poaching. Their blood will be jaded upon somebody. I'm Mike Ndiema. I'm a Kenyan working for conservation outcomes 
a company known for training and deporting officers. Mozambique is about 42,000 square kilometers. <laughs> and they have only 160 scouts. You know, we're permanently short of equipment. You know, you name it, you know, we need more GPSs. We need to change our boots more often. We need to change our cars over more often. You know, they start getting tired and old. They break down when you're in operations, so. Yeah, it's a permanent battle trying to keep up with the budget of the cost of operating this. So this is Igor. He was one of Nick Brandt's favorite animals when he came to photograph in Amaseli. Igor was killed by poachers, which is what actually triggered Nick to get involved in the whole conservation world. We joined up at that point. So yeah, in many ways, he was a trigger of creating what's now Big Life Foundation. These are the records of elephant mortalities going back to 211. Um, the ones in red are poaching cases, the ones in green are human and wildlife conflict. Last month we lost two to poisoning and it's so easy. When you, once you know an elephant's root, you just have to lay some melon or a pumpkin or something with a teaspoon of poison. Normally it's stuff called furidan. A teaspoon in a melon will, will kill an elephant within hours. But it can, if they get a small dose, I've seen elephants take about two weeks to die. He had worked out that the area where we live, there's water there and everything. So as soon as he got injured, he knew that he had to get back there because he was a, and it was literally a beeline. The line on the map was just straight, about 40 miles. He was probably about 45, and his one tusk weighed over 100 pounds. Got a unique animal in this day and age. I'm pissed off. <laughs> but I think we'll fix it. Flying's a big budget, but it's essential. There's no way we could cover the area we do without having wings. Um, yeah, we've probably got a plane in the air. Five out of seven days. When I first learned about mountain bull, I went home very excited back in Nairobi and I told all my family about this crazy, energetic, fun elephant. I've previously done articles on him, one when he was detasked and the second time was when we fixed a new collar. 
we've been following his movement. We've put a lot of effort to film him and bring a lot of light and everything. This animal was shot six times before and he survived. We treated and he survived. He was healed of those wounds. In a way, I felt that he was bulletproof. Of all the elephants that I knew, uh, you know, he'd survived for so long. There'd been so many efforts along the way to protect him, even sawing off his tusks to make him less tempting to poachers. I mean, he was one very intelligent animal who found his way out, how he could still keep his 30 years migratory route beside all the people and all the farms and all these things. There's so many young bulls that would depend on him, where he goes, how he does it. When I heard that Mountain Bull had been poached, I was just devastated. I couldn't believe it. Of course, he was just as vulnerable as any other elephant. As a person who have known Mountain Bull for the last 10 years, I feel so terrible that actually he died in the worst way possible. They have this massive, heavy, very sharp metal that they're just actually waiting from above. And as soon as the elephant walks under the tree, they just let it go down. And as soon as it gets in and he runs away with it, it just keeps cutting in. Some, sometimes we don't believe that mountain bull have died. The caller, it, it's the one that's telling us that, you know, he's no longer there. And it's really been pain and been sad for entire team. I don't, I don't have words to explain. When you're a writer, you have to collect information about these animals and you tend to get attached because they have he had such great personality, he was so charismatic. And I never thought I'd write a story about his poaching, ever. Mountain bull is dead. And when I went there, you know, he's a huge animal. I was so shocked. And I love them. I really love them. In future, we might not be having elephants. I would say, for example, my, my grandchildren will never know what elephants are. They will just be hearing stories that were big, huge animal called elephants. And I think what his death really brought home to me was that that was one elephant that we knew particularly well, but there are 33,000 other elephants just like him that are dying every year. Maybe more. Yes, it is wonderful art, but do we want to display wonderful art that has involved so much grief and suffering? Maybe it came from their grandparents. Maybe they can't bear to destroy it, but I would beg people not to display it. We need to talk to people in a language they can understand. We need to relate. We cannot sit and give speeches about this and that 
in big hotels and talk about anti-poaching and expect that to get to a village somewhere in the middle of a park or next to a park. Every time I have an opportunity to speak on TV, I speak directly to ladies. I said, if your husband is a poacher and you know for sure he's involved in something, please speak with him, let him stop. Because either he's gonna go to jail, he's gonna be wounded, or worse, he will be killed. And this is not good for children, not good for you. And women are responding to that. Suggested to be Tanzania lands for religion and conservation. Is it their fault? Is it our fault? Is it the government's fault? It doesn't matter right now, we have a problem. We have an, a state of emergency. I would try to do maybe through radio because they do listen to the radio a lot um, and try to explain that um, you know this wildlife you know they have every right to be here It means let us protect elephant tusks and rhino horns. Everybody has access to a radio or music, even in the remotest of places. Lazima utumie ukatili kidogo kusababu ukifikiria sana namna na vila limika, utamonea uruma kiwezikana unozo watu ukamuacha. Sasa kukua weo umetoka nyumbani mefuata, umemjeruki wangu kiri na unategemea kwamba ukimalizia unapata hela basi usio unapelekea sana mawazo yako akumfikiria kwamba anamuonea that you can me me I can't call that people that I can call something else if you are human being you can't do that whatever is right here it's coming from my heart i'm a poet this is me i want to speak myself i want my voice going out about animals This is the first global march for another species in the history of humankind. We are shouting out, we are crying out. There are um, our young brothers that will never have the chance to see elephants or rhinos again. They should listen and they should play their part. I'm 
The three key things that we have to do to stop this Holocaust is we have to stop the killing, we have to stop the trafficking, and we have to stop the demand. And I think we need to build on that to get this African voice coming out that is shouting in favor of elephants to the world because it exists. We're losing ground, but we have to just keep on fighting for as long as we can. We're seeing changes in political will that will come in at the 11th hour. It's not just in America and the importing world. We've heard the Chinese express great concern about what's happening to the elephants. Yeah. 